All right, everybody. So today we're going to be going over full thickness burns. So this is a burn that goes all the way through all three layers of the skin. And so let's get into it. It's also commonly referred to as a third degree burn. So that's something that if you hear people refer to it as that, it's the same thing, but the boards will refer to it as a full thickness burn. So just make sure you understand that that is what the boards is going to be talking about. So let's go over the anatomy first. So we have the skin, basically. When we're talking about burns, they're going to be talking about the skin. There are different parts of the body that you can still burn. You can burn your eyes, which is kind of interesting. You get a sunburn in your eyes. Um, but just making sure in the scope of the boards that we're just talking about the skin. So if we go over our three layers of the skin, we have our epidermis on top. Remember, that's our five layers of tissue with the basal layer at the bottom. Remember, that's a common site to get um, skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma. And so um, the epidermis, if you burn just the epidermis, that's a first degree burn. So just a superficial burn. That's like a sunburn or something like that. When it goes into the dermis, when it becomes a, a like second degree burn, basically, as we're talking about, it can be either a partial thickness, um, like a superficial partial thickness burn or a deep partial thickness burn. Both of those are going to affect the dermis. The superficial one goes a little bit through the dermis. And then this deep one goes all the way through the dermis. The way you'll tell the difference between that one and like a sunburn is you'll notice that it'll be like blistering and stuff. When we see blistering, weeping, that's a second degree burn. Now, when we have a third degree burn, which is a full thickness burn, the epidermis is gone, the dermis is gone, and the subcutaneous tissue is exposed. So we're talking about the subcutaneous tissue. That's the adipose tissue, the fat tissue. Um, you see like blood vessels and everything in this picture over here. That's all going to be starting to become exposed and stuff like that. Now, if it goes all the way through the subcutaneous tissue, that's when it's referred to as a subdermal burn. That's a different type of burn. That one's really, really bad, but this is, this is still bad, but subdermal means it's going all the way through. So think like fourth degree burn, technically. Um, remember how we have our um, stage four pressure ulcers going all the way through exposing bone and tendon. That's a subdermal burn. We're just talking about the full thickness burn where just as scratching the surface of exposing the subcutaneous tissue. So dermis gone, epidermis gone, subcutaneous tissue is exposed. And then our free nerve endings, remember our nociceptors, those are our pain receptors. Those are gone as well. So this is very important because our pain receptors are gone. And that is why the full thickness burn is painless because our nerves are gone. Now with the second degree, the partial thickness burn, the nerve endings are still there. So no nerve endings, they've been burned away. They're gone they're out of here. So how do we get a burn? We kind of have different ways that we get burns. Uh, we're talking about etiology. So the main thing is that we see is a thermal burn. So again, like fire, getting scalding water thrown on you, steam burns. People don't think about that too much, but steam definitely can cause a third degree burn. Um, electrical burns. So remember get, getting stuck in a socket or something like that. Short circuiting, a voltage problem, circuit problem, something bad happening. Lightning counts as an electrical burn as well. And then if you have like a mix of water and electricity. Now remember with our electrical burns to make sure we're checking heart rate because there could be arrhythmias going on because it's affecting the electricity in the heart. So again, if you see an electrical burn, know that there's going to be a problem with the arrhythmias in the heart. So causes of our burns, we kind of went over that. What's going on exactly? We kind of went over that destruction, the epidermis, dermis, and free nerve endings, exposing the subcutaneous tissue. Now, just an important thing to know about who would be most likely to get burns. Um, individuals under the age of 70 are most likely to get burns. And then males are more likely to get burned than females. So females, we unfortunately get the short end of the stick when it comes to all the autoimmune problems. Males will get the short end of the stick when it comes to traumatic things like spinal cord injuries, TBIs, and burns. So what does this look like? The big thing to talk about when it comes to burns is that there's going to be little to no exudate coming out of the burn itself. So it's going to be relatively dry, like quote unquote dry in comparison to other types of burns. So remember our second degree, our partial thickness, those are weepy because they have the blisters. This one's dry. We'll see white coloring. So you can see in this picture here, nobody take me down. Um, you can see there's a lot of whiteness here. And then along the outside of the burn, you're going to see this reddish like erythemous kind of area. And so that's just going to be granulation tissue kind of starting to show up. Um, and so the burn is the exposure of the adipose and subcutaneous tissue. That's why it looks white. So if you see white, just know that we're talking about a third degree burn. The boards might ask you to classify burns. So just make sure you know the difference. So inside of that burned area, there's going to be no pain. Like the patient's not going to be able to feel anything because all the nerves are fried. Like all the nerves are just gone. So they're not going to feel anything. Now, as they get to the outside of the tissue where it's still kind of somewhat intact, they will feel 
feel extremely painful. So the burn in some places might be painful and in other places could be completely painless. So inside that area, no pain because the nerves are gone. Now we're going to see contractures of the surrounding musculature. So let's say you have a burn to the like antecubital space on your forearm. If it's burned there, the surrounding tissue is going to start to contract around it and you'll end up with like an elbow contracture. So just understand the muscles underneath will start to contract instinctively. And so we got to make sure we're maintaining all of that range of motion with those areas. Now we're going to see that the patient is at risk for shock. So hypovolemia. So remember hypo means low. So volume, so low volume. So they're at risk for going into just shock in general. So what's going to happen is our urine output's going to go down. Our blood pressure is going to absolutely tank because everything's just crashing. And then we're also going to see that this is going to affect their electrolytes because of the decrease in urine output. So they might be shaking. They might have just spasms and stuff like that. Involuntary muscular contractures contractions because they don't have enough electrolytes circling around. So they're going to have difficulty regulating their temperature as well because all of their sensory stuff and their skin is gone. And then they're also going to have um, just exposed tissue and area. So they're going to get really cold and then they'll try to warm up and they'll get really hot. So they have absolutely no sense of regulating their own body temperature. This patient, because everything's open, remember when everything opens, the patient is at risk for infection. Anytime we break the skin, we're at risk for infection. So any sort of cut, burn, anything, when it's exposed, that means that all of our microbes can get in and cause problems. So any exposure, we're worried. And especially with a third degree burn, we have a high risk of infection with this patient. And then the patient might have difficulty breathing due to the hypovolemia going into shock and everything. And also some changes in their cognitive status, which I think people don't think about, but it will affect their cognition. So what are we doing with this patient? We got to make sure the patient's stable first. So the first three days after the burn, we're letting people who get paid a lot more than us take care of that. So it's doctors, nurses, all of them stabilizing the patient. Got to make sure blood pressure goes into an acceptable range, that the electrolytes are normal, that the temperature is okay, and then there's no risk for fever or hypothermia. So biggest thing is mitigating risk of infection because if they get an infection, they could get septic and die. So we don't want that. Um, skin grafting is a big thing that they'll be using. So there's various different types of skin grafts. I would look over them a little bit just to make sure you're aware, but like an autograft is from yourself, an allograft is from someone else. And then there's a xenograft, which is where they've been using a lot of tilapia and tilapia skin in order to help with burn grafts, which is kind of cool. So us as PTAs, we're working on mobility, ambulation, flexibility exercise with this patient to decrease the risk of pressure ulcers. So we want to make sure they're mobile. So they're not sitting there getting a pressure ulcer and we don't want them to get contractures. That's a big thing too. We don't want the muscles to involuntarily contract. We will not be seeing the patient until about five days after their burn because like they got to stabilize over those three days. And the fourth day, the PT comes in, evaluates them. And then by the time they come to a PTA, it's like day five. So we're getting them after they've been stabilized. So don't worry about that. When we are working with the patient, we work on energy conservation techniques, pacing, and then we wor work on a lot of things to help decrease their risk of bottoming out blood pressure wise. So slow positional changes, so sit them up slowly, make sure they're not dizzy or anything, take blood pressure very frequently. So supine, sitting, walking, always be taking that to avoid orthostatic hypotension. Patient's going to have a lot of compression garments that they're going to be given. I don't know if you've seen them for burns. They're pretty cool. They kind of look similar to the lymphedema ones, but it's to help maintain integrity of the skin grafts and then also to decrease edema in the area. So we don't want it to be blow it up basically. Once the graft has taken hold and everything's stabilized and it seems like it's working, we'll progress into a normal strength and conditioning program to help the patient get back to their functional activities. So walking, standing, um, sit to stands, all of that stuff, just anything to get them back to their quote unquote normal life post burn as close as possible as we can get to their prior level of function. So keywords we want to think about with this, guys, it goes completely through the epidermis and the dermis and it reaches the subcutaneous tissue. We're going to want to avoid infection and hypovolemia with this patient. Those are the big things. Definitely avoiding that infection. That's a big one. Um, understand that it's going to be painless within the wound site. And then splinting and positioning to avoid contractures with this patient. So we'll see that the patient will have the white area with the pink outside of it. So if it's describing it this way, just know that that means it's a full thickness burn. All right, everybody, sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a burn victim in an inpatient facility. The patient has been immobilized for some time and is in a negative pressure room to help facilitate wound healing. Which of the following findings would be most concerning for the physical therapist to observe? So it should say physical therapist assistant. My apologies, guys. Um, one, blood pressure of 105 over 65 in sitting. 
Two, patient demonstrates contracture of hamstrings, limiting knee extension. Three, patient demonstrates a fever of 40 degrees Celsius. Or four, a patient is unable to feel sensation inside of the wound bed. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is the patient demonstrates a fever of 40 degrees Celsius. So this is very concerning for the patient. This is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. What does fever mean? So if we see any sort of fever, I mean, we're saying fever here, even if you didn't know what 40 degrees was, it's, it's a fever. Um, that's bad. That indicates infection. We do not want the patient to become infected. If the patient becomes infected, then they can get a disease, become systemic become septic and die. We don't want that. So again, that's the most concerning thing of these findings. Blood pressure 105 over 65 and sitting, they're just dropping a little low. That's not a concerning blood pressure. It's just like, mm, not the best. Um, patient demonstrates contractures. I mean, this is concerning, but I wouldn't say like, uh, it's not, it's not as concerning as a fever. So basically the question is asking which one of these is the most concerning. And then, um, patient unable to feel sensation inside the wound bed. That is a typical response for a full thickness burn. Um, and so we're kind of seeing that the patient has, is unable to feel sensation. So yes, this is a, I inferred to context of this question. It is a full thickness burn patient. So Hope that this helps you guys understand uh, burns. I might need to reword this question in my PowerPoint, but I hope that this was helpful, everybody. Burns get a little confusing, but full thickness burns are definitely those that are the most concerning for our patients. So that's it for this one. Take care, guys, and I'll see you on the next one.